we're going to have Lynn speak and then go right into the questions and answers. She is the head of the Foundation for the Revival of Classical Culture. Lynn. Well, thank you very much. So, hello. Uh, I would first like to take this opportunity to thank Helga LaRouche uh, for her work in organizing this and many other conferences which have sought to change the world through the revival of classical culture. Um, and that is actually the mission of our foundation. I could tell you that she has many friends in China and that while they could not be here today, I know from my recent travels in China that they too are in full, in full support of this effort. And I've spoken to people who are in um, think tanks and in cultural institutions and in the media and ch throughout China who have the greatest respect for her. Um, unlike many people in the West, I do not believe that China have settled the question of reviving classical culture favorably yet. Um, I, yes, it is a Confucianist outlook that has, I think, come upon the nation, which is uh, very, really great. When I was in China in September, um, President Xi Jinping spoke on the need for Confucianism to be taken up once again in China. Uh, however, um, and that is very good. But I feel that something is still out of tune uh, there. I was recently at a classical concert in Shanghai where people took to both check their email and actually speak on the phone in the middle of a concert. So um, it, it's, it's not good enough, obviously, to order or encourage um, or to suggest to people that they play a classical instrument simply because that it's good for you, right? There's something much deeper that, that must be learned. And in China, as well as throughout the world, uh, before classical culture can truly be said to have been revived. So I would therefore very much like to talk about our foundation's mission to take up the issue of proper tuning of musical performances, especially when we come to the question of classical music. Uh, the Foundation for the Revival of Classical Culture in May of May 13th of 2012 held a Mother's Day uh, concert at Carnegie Hall featuring uh, concert pianist Tian Jiang. Uh, now I've known, who I've known for a number of years, uh, he happens to be from the same town that I am from, Shanghai. Uh, Tian had to learn to play the music of Bach and Beethoven and Mozart in secret when he was growing up because at that time uh, when he was growing up, China was undergoing the Cultural Revolution. And so all things classical, uh, Asian and Western, was forbidden. Now this changed in the 1970s and by 1979, the great American violinist Isaac Stern went to China uh, as a cultural ambassador, and while on that tour, he chose five young Chinese musicians to become the first group uh, ever of, of young musicians to participate in a cultural exchange between China and America, and Tian was one of the five young musicians who came over in 1980 to China, and actually under the sponsorship of Diane Feinstein, um, uh, to study Western classical music in America. Uh, so our, our classical, our, our Mother's Day concert, which was performed at the Isaac Stern Auditorium uh, at Carnegie Hall, was appropriately dedicated to this great American uh, performer, violinist, Isaac Stern. And it was meant to thank a great artist in the only way that you can or should thank uh, any great artist, uh, by passing on the gift of great culture and music to the next generation of young people. Uh, in this case, we organized what was considered by many, including Carnegie Hall and the Department of Education, uh, an impossible audience, uh, 1,700 public school students and their parents and teachers from over 70 public schools as well as private schools uh, came to the concert and they came on their own and they, they came from the tri-boroughs, all 
five of them, actually. Um, this concert now was, wasn't an easy listening concert. We, we had what was performed was a transcription of Bach's organ toccata in C major and Mozart's uh, fantasy in C minor, which was the K-475, and Beethoven's uh, Appassionata uh, piano sonata, Opus 57, F minor, and then after intermission, Brahms' Handel variations, which was in B flat major. Um, now, this concert was very successful and it was recorded. What happened after the concert was I, I had the honor of meeting Mr. LaRouche to tell him about our foundation and about our um, future plans for our ne next concert. Uh, in the course of this meeting, we played for him Tian's concert and especially the Brahms Handel variations. He said something very interesting to me after he heard it and he said, it's been many years since I've heard this piece, but it comes back to me as if I heard it yesterday. Uh, I've, but I've never heard it played as such high tuning. Um, he said that the musician, you could hear the musician compensating for this high tuning, high pitch by increasing the tempi of the, of, of the music. And he's done a good job, but you know, this is Brahms and Brahms doesn't need the speed uh, to be penetrating. In fact, the magnificence of Brahms is in that it, it is not fast while being penetrating. So that something has to be done to protect the musicians. Now, I, I thought quite a bit on this <laughs> afterwards, and I said, hmm, somebody has to protect the musicians from the systematic destruction of musical performance and music itself. Uh, well, good music anyways. <laughs> uh, so it was at this point that our upcoming concert uh, on May 28th, 2013 had a new mission. We decided that instead of modern concert tuning of A442, this concert would be properly tuned at what is often referred to as the Verdi tuning because the great Italian composer Giuseppe Verdi campaigned for and got passed in the Italian legislatures the um, capping of concert tuning to a no higher than A435, which this Verdi tuning, by the way, is a, a, a term of a, a sort of a protectionist measure for both the voice and the composition, and it's based on a middle concert C of middle C of 256 cycles per second, and so this middle C C256 is. Uh, equal to approximately a range of between 427 to 435 cycles per second. So appropriately, we, type, we titled our 2013 concert at Carnegie Hall to be the properly tuned masterpieces. Um, appropriate because it's not lower tuning, but proper tuning. Now, the piano was then tuned to 430, I believe, and Tian signed on to this, and he, uh, we had a Steinway that was tuned by Steinway Hall uh, a week before the concert, and he took a week to practice on this. Uh, and in this concert, he played for us again, Brahms, Handel Variations, and Beethoven's Appassionata. He, in addition to that, also played Beethoven's Seventh Piano Sonata in D major, and several Chopin pieces. Um, it was remarked to me afterwards, after the concert, by Carnegie, Hill, Carnegie Hall's own Grammy Award winning sound engineer who was Polish and partial to the Polish composer Friedrich Chopin that he had never heard Chopin played with such a beautiful vocal intonation. He said that Chopin's favorite composer was the Italian uh, operatic composer Bellini, and so Chopin is one of the most bel belcanto vocal instrumental composers. And in our concert, he could hear the belcanto singing, the bel belcanto voicing. And by the way, we recorded that concert too, and the CDs are actually available outside if anybody wants to uh, pur uh, purchase it and listen to the music um, in support of our foundation. Now, often, in my discussions or fights with people about proper tuning, I, I would come up against what is um, practical or what is, you know, it's not practical for us to tune properly because the modern instrument, especially the wind and brass instruments, can't tune to the proper pitch or something like that. Or people say, well, if it's just tuning, it, it's a matter of taste, isn't it? But in fact, it's exactly not a matter of taste. 
the issue of proper tuning is a matter of principle. It is a, it's a principled propagation of beauty. And beauty is not a taste. It's a requirement of the human soul. It's a prerequisite of the human soul. Now, our foundation intend to conduct a proper investigation into the science of proper tuning. And we're gonna be hosting a uh, seminar on music, neurology, physiology, and human cognition, or in another word, on the relationship between the music, between music, the brain, the mind, and cognition. And this is gonna take place sometimes in next year, 2015, in the spring. So in closing, I urge you to please stay tuned and get tuned. <laughs>